like to offer everybody here tonight a prayer from my faith tradition before we get started. God of many names, today we've come together, led by faith, to do the hard things, but also the right things. We're here to help people who are sick, guide those who've lost their way, and stand up for those who don't have the power to stand up for themselves. We've come here before you with renewed hope in our hearts, answering the call of spirit to work for justice equity, and compassion. We believe in Jacksonville. We believe in a future where people who are hurting can be given the justice that they are owed, and the least among us are not left behind. We are here because we believe our community can become a better version of itself. God of many names, please bless those who've come to this assembly to do justice in your name and guide us as we work together for a dream that is awakening. Amen. Good evening. Welcome to the 2024 I Care Nehemiah Assembly. Each year we gather congregations and people in Duval County for the purpose of meeting with public officials about critical community issues. We have listened to the people we have heard their concerns. We have researched the issues raised and developed workable solutions. And tonight, we are here to take action. Because when we work together, you'll hear our leaders say that phrase a lot tonight. And we need to hear you respond. So let's try that again. When we work together, well done. We're all here tonight for this purpose, to make great things happen. We are here to bring positive change to life, to remove the boundaries to justice. As people of faith, we believe Jacksonville can be a place where people experience justice for all, not just justice for some. This is our mission, and tonight we bear witness to it. Tonight's meeting is not a public forum for collecting input on community issues. That has already been thoroughly accomplished. We have only one purpose tonight, to present ourselves unified and demand solutions. The statements and positions I Care takes tonight are the results of many months of research and engagement. While we're not taking questions from the floor, should you have any concerns or questions, please approach a member of our floor team. They will assist you. They are members of I Care congregations and are wearing black shirts. So could you wave floor team? I care is assertive in the pursuit of justice for all people, but we are not rude. We do not make personal attacks or assaults or assaults on character. We will not boo or make negative comments when we hear things we do not like. Instead, our response will be a protest of silence. So let's practice that. Floor team, your signals. These guests are our elected officials, and we will treat them with respect. Our questions will be direct and straightforward. Consequently, we expect our guests to offer direct and straightforward responses. This may be a unique experience for some tonight. Some may even find it a bit odd or uncomfortable. But tonight's meeting is nothing more and nothing less than the way our nation came into being and has been shaped and reshaped. Not only is it a proven and necessary means to solve the problems of the community, it is an honored practice in our country. It is government of the people and by the people and for the people. Therefore, we come together tonight asking our officials to change policies and practices that are harming our city. Tonight, we are focused on calling for a proven solution to reduce violence, 
Our demands may raise tension and cause discomfort. Our guest, these public officials may neither like participating tonight nor feel inclined to act in our demands. But it is both reasonable and right for us to present these demands. While some may grumble from a safe distance through social media or letters to newspapers, we are here in person making our cases face to face. And we've given our elected officials the same opportunity to come here face to face. And let us be specific. Are we willing to accept business as usual when we're known as the murder capital of Florida? Are we willing to be patient when 124 people were killed last year? Are we willing to accept a violence intervention program that has failed to reduce violence? As people of faith and citizens of this nation, we have a moral and spiritual obligation, a duty to demand justice from our elected officials on behalf of those who are not adequately served. If we do not, then who will? And all will suffer for it, our families, our friends, and neighbors. With these things in mind, we will be direct this evening. Effectively and thoroughly addressing these matters requires specific actions for which we make demands of our public officials. We have provided these questions to our guests in advance. We have no interest in surprising anyone. In our questions, we will simply and directly ask for a yes or no answer. If we receive a no, we will press for a change of mind. No only prolongs suffering. Last year, Sheriff Waters said no, and 124 more lives were lost. Since our goal tonight is to make change, we will cheer only when our guest gives a yes response. While we may be disappointed when someone says no, we will offer no response to a refusal to exercise their power and influence for justice. So please hold any applause until we clearly hear a yes. The floor team will help us cheer together. So floor team, help us with that. Yes. Thank you. At some point, we may call for a caucus to discuss our response to an official's answer. If this occurs, remain in your seats as they will work through this. We have a proud tradition of beginning and ending on time. So we will have an official timekeeper tonight, and each participant has been advised of their time constraints. It is my privilege to introduce to you those who will act on our behalf this evening. Pastor Willie Barnes of St. Paul AME, Loidette Noizet of Abyssinia Missionary Baptist Church, Alice Harmon of Second Missionary Baptist Church, Geneva Pittman of St. Paul AME, Pastor Roger Williams of Philip R. Cousins AME, and Pastor Adam Gray of Riverside Church at Park and King. And those members will be the ones responding to Sheriff Williams to, or Sheriff Waters tonight, excuse me. ICARE has a tradition of cheering together as a sign of solidarity and a demonstration of our power. I shared one of those cheers at the beginning, and I'd like to practice another. When we hear the words, who cares, we respond, I care. You know the drill. Who cares? I care. Who cares? I care. It is important in our organization to know how many people came tonight. So please, if you haven't already, turn in your ticket to the floor team members if you, again, have not done it already. Finally, it is because of the work of our Justice Ministry Network members that we're able to turn out impressive numbers of people to our annual Nehemiah assemblies. So please stand if you've invited someone tonight to tonight's assembly. Please stand. Don't be shy. We celebrate your work tonight, and on May 20th, we'll have a celebration ceremony that's planned for you, and that will be at Woodlawn Presbyterian Church at 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing all of you then, to thank you for your hard work and dedication to justice. And it looks like everybody's seated already, so I don't have to say that. Thank you, each and every one, for coming tonight to make justice a reality for all the people of Jacksonville, because when we work together,
strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. And it reaches to me. It's so good to see all of you here tonight to ensure fairness and justice for every person in our city. This is our 26th Nehemiah Assembly, and we are setting a legacy in Jacksonville that people of faith do justice. Who cares? I care. I now call this Nehemiah Assembly to order. Before we get started, I would appoint our timekeeper, who is charged with keeping us on time tonight, Alice Robinson West. She will hold up a yellow sign when you, have, when you are out of time. We ask that all speakers respect our time. Tonight is a night of continuing tradition and creating new opportunities. For almost three decades, we have given public officials the opportunities to be on the side of justice and righteousness, to stand with all of us in making Jacksonville the best it can be. We recognize that when we work together, great things happen. We are here tonight to invite our officials to take specific actions to make great things happen for our city. The solutions we propose are reasonable. Experts is reasonable. Asking the sheriff to meet with us and share reports with us is reasonable. Tonight, he will make a choice. He will choose to help solve problems or he will choose to allow the problems to continue. In all of our faith traditions, we are expected to be on the side of the oppressed. In my faith tradition, we strive to live by seven principles. First, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We also affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Yes, we are all here to improve the lives of the underserved and the oppressed. Tonight, we will highlight the need for comfort and relief in a city that is filled with violence. We pray for those who are mourning loved ones taken by gun violence. We struggle with methods to offset the, violent, the effect of violence on our children. We must find a way to reduce this gun violence. The biblical namesake for tonight's assembly, Nehemiah, gives us a concrete example of how to solve big community problems. Nehemiah stood with the people of his community who were being exploited by money lenders. He called the money lenders out in front of the great assembly for their un unjust practices. He gave them a solution. The money lenders made a choice to make things right for the oppressed. Like Nehemiah, who called on the money lenders to change their practices, 
we are calling on our sheriff to make changes in our city. This is not personal. We are asking him to make these changes because he has the power to do so. Sheriff Waters, we want you to be celebrated as a leader for driving down the number of murders in Jacksonville. We want to be able to lift up the group violence intervention program in Jacksonville as being effective in reducing the number of murders. We want to see a 30 to 60 percent reduction in homicides as has happened in many cities, such as Boston, Cincinnati, and Indian Indianapolis. We are here tonight to support you in making the choice to seek improvements in your group violence intervention program. We need you to hear the cry of this community. We pray that you will do everything in your power to make our city better. The people here tonight have made their choice. We've chosen to call for change. Tonight we are united in spirit and purpose. This is driven by the mandate for all of us to do justice and to use the power of armed numbers to defend the oppressed. When we work together, great things happen. people of faith, we have a responsibility to care for the earth. Each of our traditions have teachings about caring for all of God's creation. In the past few years, our committee has been focused on a troubling problem that is flooding. Because flooding damages cars and homes, takes lives, and washes pollution into the river. Almost everyone in eye care had a story about flooding. A home that flooded, a church that flooded, a street that flooded. Flooding makes life harder for people all over this community. That is why it was critical that our city fund and perform a study to learn how flooding will affect us both today and in the future. Our city began conversations in 2019 about doing a flood vulnerability assessment. Beginning this year, flood vulnerability assessments are now required in order to obtain state funding for resiliency projects like higher buckhead and better drainage systems. At least $100 million is going to be available each year, but only to communities that have completed this assessment. That's why in 2022, we called on our city to complete a flood vulnerability assessment. Our city leaders heard us, heard that call, and today, we have good news to share. Jacksonville has now published its flood vulnerability assessment. Okay. <laughs> because who cares? Okay, our city's vulnerability assessment was released in October as part of its resiliency strategy. And you can find it on the city's resilient Jacksonville website. We celebrate the city leaders who made this critical step happen. Because when we work together, great things and because she has been instrumental in ensuring the success of this strategy, we invite our city chief resilience officer to share some of the actions that are already underway.
Hello. I'm delighted to be with you virtually to share details on Jacksonville's whole of government resilience strategy, a first for our city and our region. Jacksonville is the largest city by land area in the continental U.S. at 850 square miles. And more than half of our city is undeveloped forests, wetlands, grasslands, and agricultural areas. Our city is surrounded by water with more than 1,500 linear miles of shoreline along the Atlantic Ocean, the St. Johns River, and its many tributaries. Our relationship with water is both a great strength and our Achilles heel if we do not tackle the increasing challenges of climate change and flood risk head on. We've already seen the effects of climate change impact our city from storms like Matthew and Irma and last summer's record temperatures. And we know that rising sea levels and more frequent and intense storms are here to stay. Given all of this, our size and our scale required a new approach to resilience for Jacksonville. To that end, Jacksonville started developing a long-term resilience strategy back in 2021, taking into account historic vulnerabilities, the estimated impacts from storms, sea level rise, extreme heat events, as well as examining opportunities for action across every neighborhood of our city. In October 2023, we launched a groundbreaking strategy called Resilient Jacksonville that is backed by science and data, and it lays out the actions we must take to meaningfully address our risks. A great deal of care was taken to ensure that every corner of Jacksonville was studied and that holistic and place-based resilience actions were tailored to the many people, geographies, communities, and ecosystems that make up Jacksonville. Over the next 50 years, Jacksonville is expected to see over half a million new residents moving to our city. As we work to address the impacts of climate change today, we are aware that our planning needs to go beyond current residents and infrastructure and plan for our growing city. To ensure we have housing, roadway networks, and utilities to meet the needs of the future. Our strategy dives deep into where and how we develop, and we are actively working with our partners in the development community to revise our land development regulations and guide smart growth into areas of our city that are high and dry and well connected to existing infrastructure. Finally, we're proud to be pioneering new avenues for understanding our risks through the development of the country's first citywide compound flood model that will look at the combined impacts of storm surge, tidal fluctuations, riverine events, and stormwater, and how these types of flooding interact with each other and are influenced by wind. This cutting edge model will give Jacksonville the clearest picture of our flood risk and allow us to make informed capital planning and emergency decisions in real time. With Resilient Jacksonville as our guide, Jacksonville is entering a new era of innovation and moving quickly towards a brighter, more resilient future for the next 50 years and beyond. Thank you. Our Chief Resiliency Officer will join us in person at the celebration on May 20th. We look forward to hearing more about the steps our community has taken. We will follow up to ensure this study is formally accepted by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in June. I remember when we began our search, experts told us that getting a vulnerability assessment for Jacksonville would be expensive. One of the most difficult assessments in the state. Because of our exposure to all the water here at the mouth of the St. John's River. So it is a big deal that we accomplish this again. We celebrate our city leaders for funding and following through on this assessment. This is a beginning that can help make our city a safer place for us all. When we work together, these things happen. We want to ensure the people with mental illness are treated with care and dignity in our community. 
Right now, too many mentally ill people in our community are ending up in jail. People in our congregations have told stories of loved ones who called 911 and were arrested or had altercations with law enforcement. We have learned that police officers in Jacksonville were being trained to offer only two options for someone in crisis, either arrest or be Baker acted. Often the situation is escalated by police presence and the family is left with no support. Officers are not trained to de-escalate a person in crisis, leading to people with mental illness being put in restraints or subject to use of force. Today we know that there is a new 24-7 hotline to call when someone is having a mental health crisis. It's 988. You can dial 988 at any time and speak to a trained mental health professional. 988 operators can send out a trained mental health professional to the person in need. Last year, we asked the sheriff to assign his 911 coordinator to a 988 task force. He said yes and followed through on that commitment. We are also glad to report that we met with our local 988 team and learned that Sheriff's 911 team has been meeting with the 988 task force and they're even expanding their partnership. We are glad that 911 and 988 are working together. For when we work together, we researched solutions and learned about the Criminal Mental Health Project in Miami. In December, we grouped a group of uh, eye care representatives visited Miami with Dr. Tracy Polson from the mayor's office. We heard from police officers in Miami who are passionate about mental health and said that this program had changed their entire approach to policing. They reduced arrests and police shootings, saving lives and saving money. We are glad that our mayor and her office chose to learn more about this amazing program. While we were there, we heard some very hopeful news. The Soulsbacher Center is pursuing funding for programs to keep struggling people with mental illness out of jail and getting them the proper treatment. A delegation from Jacksonville is planning to visit in the spring. We hope more people in our community, including a representative from the Sheriff's Office, are inspired to take a new, better approach in Jacksonville. Who cares? I, care. I would like to invite Dr. Tracy Polson up to share more about Miami's approach and the projects she and others in the mayor's office are working on to help people with mental illness. Hello, everyone. I'd like to give a shout out and warm welcome to my council member, Jimmy Peluso, who's here with us this evening as well as my colleague, Lynn Sherman, from the mayor's office, our school board member, Warren Jones, and of course, our public defender, Charlie Kofer. It is a privilege to brief you all on my visit to Miami last December to learn about the Miami model and what aspects of this two-decade plan we can bring to Jacksonville to address the mental health and housing needs of individuals on the street. The Miami model was designed and implement, implemented to divert people with serious mental illnesses away from the criminal justice system and into community-based treatment and services. What makes the Miami model successful is the deep cross-system collaboration with judges, the courts, public defenders, state attorney, law enforcement, consumers and families, Department of Corrections, mental health providers, social security, DCF, and private foundations. All of the police departments that presented, Miami Beach, the city of Miami, and Miami-Dade, have cultures steeped in crisis intervention teams. However, this shift in culture did not happen overnight. The officers who spoke discussed the positive impact in reducing officer-involved shootings as well as their own mental health. A primary goal of this model is to reduce the role of law enforcement as first responders to mental health crises as much as possible via mental health hotlines and mobile crisis teams to help prioritize treatment over enforcement. When it is necessary for law enforcement officers to respond to individuals experiencing mental health crises, those officers should be trained in crisis intervention. JSO's co-responder program has been found to be very effective. However, there's not enough of them, and hiring licensed mental health professionals has proven to be difficult. In Duval County, we have many of the elements necessary 
for a similar model here. For example, the Mental Health Offender Program provides free pretrial release from custody and diversion to a customized plan of care to stabilize defendants with court supervision to ensure compliance. The partners of this program include Duval County judges, the state's attorney office, public defender's office, the city of Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Salzbacher Center, Lutheran Services of Florida, and Gateway Community Services. Unfortunately, the number of participants are only 20 to 40, and it is limited by funding. Building synergy between law enforcement and treatment providers is an important avenue to reform the criminal justice system for people with mental illness. I, along with my colleague Josh Hicks, are working with all of the stakeholders focused on mental illness and housing the unsheltered to create a strategic plan to end homelessness and to reach and treat those with severe mental illness more effectively. As I mentioned, my colleague Lynn Sherman is here. She is leading uh, May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. I'll tell you a little bit about what she has planned for that. It includes um, working with the major media outlets and doing a phone bank that's so that citizens can call and ask questions um, of their local mental health providers. Bringing together or all of the local mental health organizations to create a strategy for how we serve those with, with severe mental illnesses. I could say more, but I look forward to doing that. I want to be mindful of my time. Thank you so much. We don't want people with mental illness to be jailed or harmed in our city. Tonight, we are seeing progress. Mayor Deegans and her administration have shown great leadership on this issue. And we appreciate Dr. Paulson willingness to be here tonight to share these exciting updates. Let us celebrate their work. I'm also glad to hear the report that the sheriff fulfilled his commitment to appoint his 911 coordinator to the 988 task force. We applaud the collaboration between 911 and 988. Amen. <laughs> Lastly, we will continue to hold Sheriff Waters to his commitment to send a representative to Miami. At the last Nehemiah's action, he committed to have a member of his department to go to Miami to learn about their highly effective approach. We have spoken to the coordinators of Miami, and unfortunately, they haven't heard from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. It is important that our officials follow through on their commitment. We ask the Sheriff tonight to keep his word. Because when we work together, Great So towards the end of 2020, when my wife and I were preparing to move here to Jacksonville to answer the call to ministry at South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church, I knew it would be a change for our young family. As a family that grew up in the Midwest, Jacksonville wasn't necessarily one of the first places we thought we'd move. So, like any elder millennial, the first place I go to try to explain the city to my family is to check out YouTube. And so, I typed in YouTube, and let me tell you, it is not safe for children to be able to see because in the algorithm, what do you see at the very beginning? Nothing but violence. Eventually I had put Jacksonville food and got to learn a lot of great places and we've been all those places since. 
Now, the violence in our city casts far too long of a shadow. Last year, 124 people were murdered here in this city, and most of the victims were black men and boys, half of them under the age of 30. And friends, I don't have to tell you how shameful that is. Now, here, admittedly, is a little bit of an unscripted moment, perhaps a surprise. The truth is, Sheriff Waters, my guess is that most of us here this evening, given the option, would prefer not to be here. On such a beautiful evening such as this, I'm sure many of us would love to take in the rest of the day outside. Maybe spend the day at the beach. Oh, wait. I would rather be elsewhere other than having to once again lay out the problem of gun violence, of bringing clarity to the voices of those whose hearts break because of the continuous violence that is seared in our minds. But here we are again. We are here because there is a way we can stop future violence from happening, Group violence intervention has worked in cities like Boston, like Indianapolis, like Cincinnati, where they have dropped their number of homicides by as much from a third to over a half. Sometimes, friends, within months or weeks of starting the program, and last year, Miami set a record low for homicides because of this program. While our population size is only double, of that of Miami, our homicides numbers were almost five times greater than Miami in 2023. Seared in our minds. Now, like all of you, I have listened closely to the words of our sheriff. I have heard him talk about our city's GBI program. I have listened to the sheriff say that we are just simply pastors. And we should stay in our pulpits, and we should not preach about doctrine in our church, meaning we pastors don't know what it is to deal with GVI or violence in Jacksonville. And listen, I will tell you, I will gladly admit, I am not an expert when it comes to law enforcement and criminal justice. Honestly, don't want that job. But what I have become far too well-versed in is witnessing the brokenness of the stubbornness of power, the resulting in picking up the pieces of the lives that have come undone by too many systems that fail. And I am tired. And we are tired. However, as a pastor, And as a community gathered here, we persist because I know and we know that God calls our community to be a place where justice rolls on a river and righteous like a never-failing stream. I imagine what God's vision for our community would look like, a community where the elderly don't hide in their apartments for fear of gangs, where parents get up to see their children grow up and attend graduation ceremonies and weddings rather than funerals, where people feel safe regardless of their zip code and every neighborhood can flourish in my tradition when we pray thy kingdom come thy will be done we don't pray it flippantly we steal ourselves towards working towards the goal and that is why we are here tonight I see two council members here, Jimmy Peluso and Rock McJohnson. Thank you for being here. Good evening. As a longtime former city council member representing several high crime neighborhoods, I have witnessed many attempts at reducing violent crime. The only initiative, and I repeat, the only initiative that has worked has been the Jacksonville Journey. With the Jacksonville Journey, you wouldn't need anybody to talk to you but them. They would do it for you. But I'm here to speak to impact of violent crime on Duval County public schools, students. DCPS provides 
brief counseling for st students and teachers when a student or employee is, it, is affected by violence crime. Any type of traumatic event, such as a death of a family member by any cause, but especially violence, especially violence, we provide grief counseling. That impacts the finances of our district. Imagine having the option of teaching in a neighborhood that is constantly in the news for violent crime versus teaching in schools that are primarily in neighborhoods where this kind of crime is rare. Which would you choose? It impacts the ability to retain and recruit effective teachers. Three, students who reside in violent prone neighborhoods are usually not prepared to learn, especially in neighborhoods that have experienced violence crime. We know that students need to be in the right frame of mind to learn, an academic intellectual mindset. The closer a child is to violence, the more likely this will lead to a trauma impacted mindset. It affects the readiness of our students to learn. Four, lockdowns and lockouts caused by area police activity disrupt schools throughout the district every week, not some weeks, every week. Think about what that means to children because a lockout is called, they hear that there is danger nearby. Finally, every year a handful of students may be expelled for trying to bring a weapon to school. It's not uncommon to hear students say they need the firearm for protection to and from school. We had one student who hid his gun in the weeds on the way to school and picked it up on the way home because he was concerned about what was happening in the neighborhood. Finally, I'll leave you with this. Dr. Green, after a shooting at one of our elementary schools, went out to visit the students. And she noticed that they had been on a lockdown earlier because of that shooting. And she went to apologize and tell the students how sorry she was that it had happened. One young student said to her, quote, it's okay, Dr. Green, we are used to that. I do not want our children to become accustomed to living with violence in our neighborhoods. Thank you, God bless. Charlie Coe for the Public Defender. Uh, my office represents most of the homicide defendants or defendants who are charged with homicide in our city. And when we take on a new homicide case, we typically do a thorough background investigation on the client, where they grew up, talk to the people they grew up with, tracking the course of their lives. And we see patterns in the life experiences of our clients. A common factor that we see in clients facing murder charge is that they grew up in communities of poverty. So why is this? Well, poverty destroys families. Most of our clients have broken up and broken, have grown up in broken and chaotic homes. They are people who did not have access or did not take the opportunity to the quality education afforded to them. They are young people who were exposed to violence and other traumatic experiences from a young age. They grow up in neighborhoods where violence was so prevalent it became a norm, an afterthought by most people who live in the communities. Again and again we see the same story. At this moment, there are more people serving time in state prison from Jacksonville than any other county in the state of Florida. And we're the seventh in population. It's been that way every year that I have been in office. I check it yearly. And it's not even close. That is because Jacksonville's solution and focus to the crime problem has been to send more people to state prison for longer sentences than any other county. Now understand, Punishing people for what they have done wrong is important as any part of the criminal justice system. But solving our crime problem, not just solving crimes, solving our crime problem in Jacksonville 
is more than just investigating crimes, making arrests, and sending those people to prison. If our community does not find a way to address the condition of poverty that breed violence, we will not solve our violent crime problem in community. And if young people aren't offered real alternatives, they will continue to get involved in gangs. Our community cannot arrest and incarcerate its way out of our crime problem. We have to attack the root causes of that crime problem. And that's poverty and what poverty does to people in our communities. Tonight, we all know that the violence that is happening here in our city is unfortunately happening in many cities across our country. In communities like ours, people are being killed every single day. It almost becomes unbearable to watch the news, to bear witness to another life lost, and to watch a family, a community, be in pain. When I begin to witness that pain that agony on those families, begin to wonder how will they deal with this struggle. I think how are they going to be able to move forward. It is a pain that is familiar to me as a person and as a pastor, and I would dare say too familiar to many of us here tonight. I share this with you because I know many here are exhausted, hurting, and frustrated. I want you to know that you are seen, you are loved. Tonight, know that your community cares about you. And this is a time when we should come together as a beloved community to share our stories, our frustration, and yes, even our tears. In the beloved community, we just don't speak out but we listen as well. And we just don't listen, but we care. I wonder tonight, can you hear it? Can you hear the echoes of voices across Jacksonville that are saying enough is enough when it comes to violence? Tonight, the beloved community that speaks out and listens to say, wants to say, and wants others to hear about group violence intervention. Because without action, nothing in our city will change. We are ready to come to the table. And there is a seat at the table for everyone, including our sheriff. We will gather together again and again on a regular basis because we have to make this happen. Where there is a willingness to work and stopping the violence in our city, there should be nothing and no one that stands in our way. In the beloved community, we speak, we listen, we care, and we come together until things change. Tonight, we want to remember those who have been taken by violence in our communities. And so if you brought a picture of your loved one, we now invite you to hold it up. May we all stand. Oh. 
because of your loving care you have for us. And now, God, we pray for your comfort for those who have lost loved ones to violence. We pray that you would replace anger and hate and the desire of revenge, that you would replace it with love long-suffering and understanding. We pray, Father God, that no one should have to die to make someone else feel justified. God, we pray now that you would hold this community together. We thank you, Father God, for your word promises us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. And so, God, we pray now that you hasten the morning, that you would bring joy and remove our sorrows. It's in Christ Jesus' name we ask it now. Amen. God bless. for our sheriff to listen to people who are hurting. It's an opportunity to connect with a diverse group of constituents about changes that they want to see in our community. disappointed that the sheriff did not take this opportunity in his absence I will read the questions we plan to ask Sheriff Waters number one will you meet with representatives from I care twice a year to discuss important problems in our community. Question two, will you contract with the National Network for Safe Communities so that Jacksonville will use the GVI program. And finally, we would have asked, will you attend the Community Problems Assembly on October the 28th to explain to us your program? 
Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is uh, anytime a pastor stands up and says this is the time in our program where we all can participate. Typically after that, you'll be reaching into your pocket or your purse or your wallet to get some money. But we're not gonna do that tonight. We want everyone to participate by way of offering your applause, your cheers, your claps, and even rising to your feet for this next segment of our program. Can you do that tonight? I said, can you do it tonight? Come on, let's practice. Can you do it tonight? And in case y'all, you all hold up the signs, I'm colorblind. <laughs> Nor do I have my glasses. So I have Pastor Adam here who's recording on uh, his phone and we would like to record a message tonight that we can share with Sheriff Waters when we meet with him. Uh, I feel the energy in the room. Uh, didn't we certainly feel the energy after some of those speakers tonight? Um, and you know what I feel even more? I feel a strong desire among all of us to see change take place in our city. Yeah. You all already got it. So tonight, I'm going to ask you three questions. There's one question. The first two questions, they'll be the same. And I want you to respond after each. And you can cheer like you've been doing. You can clap. And for those of you who are physically able, you are even able to stand to your feet tonight after each question. And we're going to record it to make sure our sheriff sees it. Is that OK tonight? All right. So, let's go. I care. Do you want the shootings to stop? I'm going to ask it one more time. I care. Do you want the shootings to stop? Yeah. And my last question, you can, how about just sit down and then we'll do it again, right? <laughs> it's something about when everyone gets up that just makes, makes it even greater. I care. Do you want Sheriff Waters to contract with the National Network to get the GVI program assessed? Yeah. Did you get everyone, Pastor Adam? Get me in the shot. Thank you. You may be seated. As we speak to Sheriff Waters, I want to make sure that all of us are on the same page when we say to the sheriff, our elected law enforcement official here in Duval County, the shootings must stop. Let's say it one more time. The shootings must stop. You and I and everyone else in this community must do everything in our power to end the shootings. And Sheriff, because of your position, you hold a greater responsibility and authority to set this community on a different path, a better path. How many of you know that life is sacred? I think I'm gonna bring all of you to my church on Sunday morning. Life is sacred because the word of God tells us that life is sacred. It's in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, where it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, God loves us. 
Jesus reinforces this when he gives his life for us on the cross. We can mirror that love back by honoring one another. Honoring one another regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our faith, or our class background. We feel that one of the greatest ways we can honor each other is by making sure that we are doing our best to ensure that each step is being taken to stop violence in our community. Getting JSO's GVI program assessed is an act of love and service aim, uh, to God aimed at protecting life and you cannot put a price on it. We are asking you, Sheriff, to bring your talents and knowledge to this problem in a new way. We want you to build on what already exists by clearly understanding where there are opportunities for growth. The expertise that the National Network can provide in this area is unmatched and unparalleled. That is why they need to conduct this assessment and you need to contract with them to do so. It is a clear signal that you as our sheriff are done with the violence and believe in the sacredness of each life in the community. We will be with you on this journey. And if you believe that, you ought to shout amen. amen. And how many of you know that when we work together, when we work together, when we work together, Just this afternoon, there was a group violence involved shooting 10 minutes from this sanctuary. Bullets went through the windows of a school bus filled with children. No children were physically harmed today. But how long will it be before those children feel safe again? How long will it be before the bullets stop ringing in their ears? How long will it be before they can focus on the upcoming school day while they ride the bus to school? This is Jacksonville's status quo. Is it good enough? The shooting? The shooting, the shooting, we are passing out a letter to Sheriff Waters for you to sign and return tonight. We will also have additional copies available at the registration table for congregations to take for people who are unable to join us tonight but want the violence to end. We will collect these letters over the next few months and will deliver them to the sheriff this summer. Once you have signed a letter tonight, please pass them towards the center aisle for the ushers to collect. Another way we wanna communicate how many people support this effort is by putting it in writing. During the civil rights movement, people often carried signs to reinforce their message. And tonight we have a banner at the front of the room that says our message, the shooting. I invite each of you to come forward and sign your name to this message. Markers are waiting for you and our ushers will guide the process. We plan to carry this banner with us as we move forward in this campaign with prayer vigils, unity walks, and press conferences. The sheriff's absence tonight is an invitation for us to continue, not an invitation to give up. We will cry out for those who are dying. This banner will stand as a memorial that too many have already lost their lives and too many continue to die in Jacksonville. It will unify all of us who want the violence to end. The shooting, ushers, if you'll please begin the process of guiding people to the banner.
If you didn't have a chance to sign the banner tonight, we will also be doing it at the end of the program. So if you would please make your way back to your seats. Will you please make your way back to your seats? If you didn't get an opportunity to sign the banner, we will have the banner here at the end of the program tonight. When we work together, we will continue our work together with a prayer vigil. On May the 13th at 9 o'clock a.m., we will gather at historical Mount Zion AME Church to pray for our community. We will pray for all of those who have been harmed by violence. This is the next way we will continue to say the shootings must stop. We hope you will join us. These details are listed in your packet. Who cares? I care. Thank you. Good evening. We are deeply concerned by Sheriff Waters' absence. We understand that the police memorial ceremony is tonight. And we give honor and due respect to those officers who have fallen in the line of duty. We offered, however, to adjust our agenda to ensure that Sheriff Waters was there by 8 p.m when that ceremony began, but he declined. Sheriff Waters is silent as we together call for the justice God requires for our community. Sheriff Waters is silent from conversations that will bring change to our community, change that will better people's lives, change that will make our community safer, change that will save lives. We have hope that the chapter of silence is ending. Last week, we received a letter from Sheriff Waters stating that he will meet with us twice a year to discuss community problems. We, hey. Who says we don't applaud? We contacted his assistant to schedule that meeting. We are still waiting for the meeting. We hope to address the problem. Too many people are dying. We believe that a collaborative approach is the most effective way to achieve this goal. When we work together, we know that addressing violence will require difficult conversations. It requires our sheriff to recognize that there is always room for improvement, to contemplate new ideas that can better their work. Because when we work together, I see you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Tonight, beloved, we have assembled as God's people to call for a Jacksonville that is just and fair for all. Each year we do this because it is the example given to us by Nehemiah. Nehemiah called a great assembly to confront the money lenders, and we too call a great assembly to confront our officials about community problems that are holding people in bondage. Yes, we have made some significant steps forward. We celebrate the flood vulnerability assessment. We will continue to celebrate the mayor, city council members, and our chief resilient officers for taking the critical steps to ensure that the study was not only an idea, but a reality. When we work together, 
we celebrate the ongoing collaboration between 988 and 911 that Sheriff Waters established. When we work together, great things happen. We celebrate Mayor Deacon and her team for not only going to Miami to visit the criminal, the criminal mental health project, but also finding ways to bring elements of that program to Jacksonville. When we work together, like Nehemiah, we also press to address a problem that the extremely high numbers of murders in our city, we were answered with a disappointing and frankly shocking no. How could anyone want to continue with business as usual when it means that someone is murdered every week in this city? In the first 15 weeks of 2024, there have been 20 murders in Jacksonville. At this point, we don't need symbolic or superficial actions. Saying you care about this problem while continuing to ignore the hard measures of whether or not your program is effective is not enough. We need actual transformation and that will only come with bold action. Together, tonight, we join together to say enough is enough. Violence cannot continue in this way. The shooting must stop. Beloved, when Frederick Douglass was pushing for an end to slavery, he said this, for it is not light that is needed but fire. It is not gentle shower, but thunder. Like Douglas described, we are beginning to feel the heat and hear the storm that has been roaring for over 20 years. We are awakening to the sufferings of our neighbors. It's startling as we begin to hear that some lives are considered to be expendable. This is a crime against God and we must proclaim it and denounce it. Every life in this community is precious, and we will continue to echo that over and over and over again. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, this darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And love for all humankind is that light. That love is the key to our faith and to our justice. So beloved, go forth and persevere with prayers and power and continue to the conversation with family and friends. When we work together, great things happen. When we work together, great things happen. Thank you. Reverend Cole talks about the image of God to each of us is created in that divine image. We have focused in on that tonight, and that's what we hold. But it goes beyond just the, the line that we are created in God's image, but that each of us deserves that opportunity. Each of us should be risen up, given that voice, made sure that we are heard. Not just that I am heard, but that we, each of us, is heard. Not just that I have liberty, but we all have liberty. Not just liberty on high, but liberty down here below for all. And so I invite you to sing if you know these sacred words. Live every 